Why do you wait there, brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in a sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Almighty God, we worship you because of your greatness, because of your beauty and your splendor and your awesomeness. We praise you because of your might, because of your strength, because you are eternal, because you are omnipotent. You can do all things. We want to thank you because you do not change. You are immutable. You are ancient of this. Father, we thank you because you have been exceedingly good to us as a nation, as a people, as a church, as individual families. We want to thank you for your grace upon our lives. We want to thank you for your protection. Several journeys have been undertaken this year, and yet you have granted us journey masses on land, on sea, on rail, on land. Take all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the provision of physical things. Thank you for the clothing. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the work that we do. Thank you for the family. Thank you for the Christian fellowship. Thank you for your church. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the grace of answer prayer. Thank you because we are what we are solely by your grace. Thank you because even when we saw death face to face, you have always come to our rescue. Thank you, Father, because you have always thwarted the plans of the enemies. You have always frustrated the effort of our adversaries. Lord, take all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you. Whatever may look like a mountain, let them become level ground in Jesus' name. Amen. Let them become level ground in Jesus' name. Amen. Should there be paradventure agent of the devil, frustrate those agents in Jesus' name. Amen. Frustrate all those agents in Jesus' name. Amen. Whosoever is working for the devil is frustrated already in Jesus' name. Amen. This week is another week of victory. Another week of success, another week of favor, another week of blessings. It shall be well with us. God is already on our side. And so we want to listen and receive from you. Father, open the door of heaven to give us blessings today through your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you have done it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Divine visitation is a common phenomenon. It's a common thing in the biblical history. And any time God visits, it is always for a purpose. God does not just visit, just to while away the time. Any time God visits a group or family or a nation or even the body of God, the body of Christ or a church, it is for a purpose. Divine visitation is always purposeful. It is always purposeful. God does not just visit for nothing. When God visited his people in the word of God, especially Moses, he told Moses, I am that I am. I am that I am. Despite all the previous efforts of Moses to serve God and his generation, he was yet to have a personal knowledge of God. Even though he had been struggling to do the will of God. He had been struggling to serve God and his generation. He was yet to have personal encounter with Yahweh. All of us need to make sure that we know God. We need to know God. We should have personal encounter with him. Unless we are familiar with him, we cannot serve him appropriately. We cannot serve him properly. We cannot serve him correctly unless you know him. You cannot relate with him correctly. 
How does one relate with someone that one does not know or familiar with? You will not know what he knows and what he wants and what he does not want. It is only by getting close to God, by knowing him, by being familiar with him, that you can serve him acceptably. God fits it for the purpose of divine revelation. God fits it also for the purpose of giving you a calling or a special assignment in life so that your life can be meaningful and fulfilling. When God spoke to Abraham, Abraham, he called him to go to a place. He will show him, despite the fact that Abraham was already a big man, to say it as a human being, Abraham had already made it. He was not a poor man at all. He was already a man of considerable means. It was not fulfilled until he responded. He, I said, but he was not fulfilled until he responded to the call of God upon his life. Have you discovered God's purpose for your life? Not until when God visited Abraham after the age of 70, after the age of retirement, that God told him, go to a place I will show you. Go to a place I will show you. It was only then that Abraham started to be fulfilling. That his life began to have meaning. Despite the fact that he was very wealthy, very rich, and yet his life amounted to next to nothing. When God feasts you, you need the visitation of God in your life. You need the visitation of the Almighty God in your life. When God visits you, he will give you a purpose to live by, a purpose to live for. God visits for the purpose of blessing his people. God visits in order to bless his people. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, we have the record of divine visitation. God visited Mary through his angel. She became the recipient of divine favor. She became the mother of Jesus. God told him, that blessed, blessed are you among women you have received the favor of the Lord this time around, this season of the year I pray the almighty God will visit you Amen. he will visit you to bless you Amen. he will visit you to favor you Amen. he will visit you to meet you at the point of your knees Amen. he will visit you to elevate you Amen. he will visit you to take you to the, to the next level in your life pilgrimage when God visits another purpose of divine visitation which we hardly talk about, but the reason best known to me and to you is divine judgment. God also visits for the purpose of divine judgment. Don't forget, God also visited our first parents in the Garden of Eden. If you read Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 11, God visited Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but unfortunately, Adam and Eve were caught unaware. He began to say, Lord, I had your voice. I had your voice. I had your voice. And I'm what? And I'm afraid. What is this? God will just say, Adam, Adam, where are you? That's the question. That was the question. Where are you? But I had your voice. I was afraid. I'm afraid. What is the what is the what is the relationship? God showed up again. In the day of Noah. God instructed him to warn the people of the impending judgment through flood. The people refused to repent, of course. Noah was considered a caricature, somebody who makes people to laugh, a fanatic, or someone who was beside himself, someone who was sick upstairs, someone who is mentally sick. Eventually, flood came as a surprise. Flood came as a surprise. Even at the building of Tower of Babel, God paid a visit to them because they were simply building a kingdom for themselves. And so God confused their language. Every kingdom that is being built apart from the death of God, God will set confusion in Jesus' name. Amen. In the gospel narratives and epistle, Jesus Christ said it several times that his coming back will be a surprise. Don't forget, he has come as the Savior. He has come as the Savior of the Lord, but he's coming as the judge. Jesus was very specific that his coming will be sudden and it will be a surprise. And the visitation of the Lord will be the one that no one can judge. No one can dodge. No one can dodge it. Every eye will see him. Every eye will behold him. It's not going to be a secret matter. 
is not going to be a secret matter if Jesus were to pay you a visit. If Jesus were to pay you a visit at the prelude before the choir began to minister in song, they said something that was very touching. I don't know whether you really took note of it. Some people plan to meet God at 12 o'clock, but what happened at 11.30? What happened at 11.30? It means that before 12 o'clock strikes, they, are already, they, are, they have gone already. They have already gone. It means that your life is not in your hand. Your life is not in your hand. We don't hold our hand. Our life is in our hand. Old people die. Young people die. Baby also die. That is why we should get prepared. If Jesus were to pay you a visit, what is he going to see in your life? What is God going to see in your life? What is Jesus going to see in your life? What is he going to see? Certainly, Christ will meet many Christians. Even those who have claimed that have given their life to Jesus, unprepared, unexpected, the attitude of many of us towards spiritual matter leave much to be desired. And it demonstrates evidence of unpreparedness unpreparedness. The way of life and behavior of many of us nowadays do not clearly show that we are expecting the soon to return king of kings. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. It's not only that he's coming back, he can come at any bloody time. Jesus can come at any bloody time. Any time. We should get prepared. Our life does not belong to us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, this, I, this, this know also that in the last day, perilous times shall come, dangerous times, difficult time will come, and it has, it has come already. It has come already. Things are difficult. For the rich, things are difficult. For the poor, things are difficult because the rich are not safe. The poor are hungry and the rich are not safe. Everybody is struggling for survival. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, those who cannot be satisfied. And who are not contented, fierce, stubborn, despisers of good things, traitors, betrayers, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Go to cinema houses, go to hotels, having a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such turn, from such turn away. The tight cleavage. To worldly things is an evidence at the expense of heavenly mandate. It's a clear case that we have forgotten that Jesus is coming very soon. Dema lost the present world. He has deserted me. Very many Christians started well, but they are no longer in faith. We see very situation, every situation as opportunity for politicking and gold digging. Even in the body of Christ, everybody is politics. Should this be the case? If Jesus were to pay you a visit, what will he meet with you? The lip service syndrome. It's a clear evidence that Christian leaders and members, we are not taking the word of God seriously again. The Bible, the authoritative word of God, is being undermined. It is high time we took the Bible seriously. As James admonishes, be the doers of the word. Let us begin to take the word of God seriously because Jesus is coming back. And whatever he meets with us is what he's going to use to judge us. Is what he's going to use. Let us forsake a life of unseriousness. A life of unseriousness. It might be true that we have put our faith in the Lord Jesus. It might be true that we have professed Jesus with our mouth. But uh, presently, where are we? And what impact are we making in the body of Christ? What impact? Are we making in the body of Christ vis a vis witnessing, vis a vis prayer life, vis a vis stewardship, vis a vis giving, vis a vis mission evangelism? The neither cold nor hot 
is the discouraging state of spiritual health among Christians today. Simply put it, it is lukewarmness. Lukewarmness. When Jesus was appear and was talking to one of the churches in Asia Minor, now more than talking, he said, I know your works. You have the name of being alive, but you are dead. Revelation 3, 3 to 6. You are dead. Para, that is why Jesus said, if I come back, will I find faith again? In the, in the original word of the New Testament, what Jesus was saying that, if I come back, will I find faith in its original form? Because all of us hold a kind of faith. It may be counterfeit too. It may be genuine. We still, we, we still hold a kind of faith, but is it the kind of faith that saves? Is it the kind of faith that makes a difference? The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, it's a new creation. Old things are passing away. Behold, they become new. Many people confess that they are Christians today, and yet you find them in all sorts of shady, shady things. They are members of secret societies. They, 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 they smoke in their hemp, add drugs. They, 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 they are stumbling blocks even for the expansion of the kingdom of God. They are agents of the devil anywhere they find themselves. If Jesus were to pay you a visit, what is, going to, what is he going to meet in your life? What is he going to meet if Jesus were to pay you a visit? The private life of many of us leaves much to be desired. If Jesus were to pay you a visit, what will he find in your closet? If there is any iniquity in your hand, you need to put it away. In your home, you need to put it away. In your house, in your place of work, you need to do away with it. The religious people may be disappointed. Those of us who are religious. Those of us who are religious, when Jesus pay you a visit, many of us may be disappointed because we engage in religious activities. We attend meetings, we occupy positions. All these are garbage without Jesus. Without Jesus. If Jesus were to pay you a visit, the unbelieving religious people will be in great trouble and danger unbelieving religious people don't forget what Jesus says in John 3 36 that if anyone does not have the son if anyone those who have Jesus they have life anyone who does not have Jesus he does not have life and the hunger and the wrath of God is upon his life if you don't have Jesus it is only Jesus that will make the difference those of us who are born into the church like, like myself and several of you, we are second or third or fourth generation Christians. We, are, we need to be very careful. God does not have grandchild. God does not have grandchild. He only has children. It is only men that have children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and great, great grandchildren. But for God, he doesn't have great grandchild. He only has children. And those who believe in the Lord Jesus, who follow Jesus steadfastly, are the children of God. The coming of Jesus is certain. The coming of Jesus is certain. Are you still in faith? Are you still in faith? Like the Corinthian Christians in Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, that examine yourself whether you are in faith. We need to examine ourselves. Are we still in faith? If actually we have put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus, does our faith really make any impact where we are? In our place of work, in our family circle, in the society, in the community, in the political party that we belong to. What difference do you make? What difference do you make? Even in the church of Christ, nominal Christianity amounts to nothing. It will not help. The coming of Jesus is certain. The coming of Jesus will be a surprise. Before one is before him. Jesus said over and over again that he was coming back. Today is the day of your salvation. Tomorrow may be late. Repent of whatever you need to repent of so that the time of refreshing may come unto you. And you should also put your faith in the Lord Jesus so that you can be saved. If Jesus were to come right now, what is he going to see in your life? What is he going to see in your life? You know, the lives of very many of us are in danger. Those, who, those of us who are highly privileged, some of us have attended mission schools from nursery, from kindergarten to university. 
It is mission school. And we are proud of that. Don't you know that I'm a, I'm a product of Baptist College? Don't you know that I attended St. Andrew's College in mission school? Yes. Yes. To whom much is given? Much is required. Much is required. What type of life are you living? Don't you know that my dad, don't you know that we started this church? Don't you know? Even it was Reverend Lagbaja and Dr. Lagasse that, that did my name. That will not take you to heaven. It is your relationship with who? With Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus. Your relationship. Where are you? Where are you? If Jesus were to come, like the voice of the Almighty God rang to our first parent in the Garden of Eden, where are you? What should be the response? Maybe I'm in this place. I am in the north. I am in the stage. Lord, oh, I heard your voice. So, and I'm what? And I'm afraid. Should that be the appropriate response? And if Jesus were to come today, because his coming will be like a thief in the night. The coming of Jesus may come through death. It may come through parousia, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. It may come through any means that he chooses. The end may come because you don't hold your hand. That's why we need to be committed. We need to be committed. We need to be committed. You know, I went somewhere this morning. Of a lot of time, a lot of time. Of a lot of time. We don't hold our lives. If Jesus were to pay you a visit now, what is he going to see in your life? Let us pray. Why do you wait there, brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne.